Hey, we're continuing the series. We, we've been in the book of Hebrews over these past several weeks, and um, we're, gonna, we're going back there today. And so um, as we've been studying through this book, and by the way, in your bulletin it says uh, that we, we're having junior church. We're not going to have junior church today. It was a, just a misprint. And so we'll, we'll, next week, we'll, that'll be the schedule for next week. And so kids are going to stand here with moms today and, and families. But um, as we've been studying through the book of Hebrews, Hebrews is all about the supremacy of Jesus. And we've talked about how Jesus is greater than. And we, in this book that we saw that Jesus is greater than the angels, how he's greater than, ma, than the law, greater than the Sabbath, how Jesus is our high priest. We've, we've talked about how Jesus, because of his death, burial, and resurrection, what he has done allows us to actually draw near to God. And uh, that's really what the book of Hebrews is all about. And as it, you get toward the end, as we are now, it gets a little more practical. The author gets a little bit more practical. And so over the past couple of weeks, we've talked about the role that faith plays in, in our life and, and, and um, in particular how we are to kind of fix our eyes and keep them on Jesus. But today we're going to see the author really makes a transition. And he makes a transition and he gives us some warning, something that we need to take heed of in our life. And there's some incredible dangers that if we don't heed to this warning that we put, could potentially fall into. Many of you remember, uh, if you're a football fan, you, you remember the name Steve McNair. Steve McNair was a quarterback for the Tennessee Titans for, for many, many years. He, he led, uh, by all accounts, he was a good leader. He led the, the Titans to uh, four uh, playoff uh, appearances. Also, it took him to a Super Bowl. But off the field, things unraveled for McNair. Um, he was arrested for a DUI and illegal gun possession back in 2003. Uh, later in 2007, he was again arrested for the DUI uh, along with his brother-in-law. He was traded to the Baltimore Ravens in 2005 and then retired in 2008 at just the age of 35. Sadly, only one year later, uh, he was found dead in a rented condominium uh, that he had in Nashville along with a 20-year-old mistress. Eventually, the police determined that McNair's death was from his girlfriend. That she had actually shot him while he was asleep and then committed suicide herself was a murder suicide. And McNair's story is a cautionary tale. And it's a cautionary tale, it's a reminder that one dumb decision, that really essentially all of us are one dumb decision away from destroying our lives and destroying our legacy. And I don't know about you, but it's a sobering thought. It's a scary thought because I sometimes know the decisions that I make aren't always so great. While sharing this story, Michael Hyatt said this. He said, I doubt McNair woke up one morning and thought, I think I'll have an affair with a woman nearly half my age. It'll be fun a few months, but then she'll kill me, then herself. My wife and my four sons will spend the rest of their lives then trying to forgive me. Man, what a tragic story. At some point along the way in McNair's life, he made a decision and one decision turned into a second decision. And like this snowball, it just got out of control and it kept compounding to the point that all these destructive decisions led to this incredible point in his life. But not every story ends that tragically. We see this way too often, right? I mean, we see this today in our world. We see this within politicians. Politicians whose careers are tarnished and sometimes ended because of misappropriations with money. We see this with school teachers. School teachers who, uh, who were once trusted and loved by their community have an inappropriate relationship with a student and then are later fired. We see this with preachers. Preachers who were once honored and, uh, and held up high for their faith, but because of they were dishonest in some way, their church sometimes is completely destroyed. I think these are all examples of people who chose the flesh over what was best. And you know what I'm saying? When I say the flesh, the flesh is kind of this carnal nature, our earthly nature, our worldly nature, our sinful desires, these things that really we're attracted to, but they're not good for us at all. N.T. Wright says it like this, human character and reputation is like a tree. It takes decades to grow, but it can be cut down or burnt to a cinder in a matter of minutes. And that's a scary thought. That's a scary thought. It's concerning. And you, but you know what? It's the story of Esau. Not that Esau was a godly man. In fact, just the opposite. Esau wasn't a godly man, but in a moment's time, he made a decision that would affect his life forever. 
A single decision that would, that would have this incredible ripple effect in his family forever. In a moment's time, he chose the flesh over what was best. And that's what we're going to examine today. We're going to see uh, Esau's story. And so we're going to go back into Genesis chapter 25. And the reason we're talking about Esau is because the author of Hebrews mentions him. And so we're going to be back there in just a few moments. But we're going to start in Genesis 25. It should be up on the screen uh, as well. I apologize, we're still having trouble with these side monitors. And so that's why we're, our font's off a little bit. Um, but we're going to start in, in Genesis 25. Remember Esau, he had a brother named Jacob. And they were twins. His father was Isaac, and his grandfather was, remember, Abraham. But before these twins were born, the Bible says they jostled in Rebekah's womb. These twins were giving this mama trouble before they were even born. Can you imagine? But listen to what, and she wondered what was happening. And listen to what, listen to what Genesis 25, the reason it says. It says, the, the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. And two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. Now, that's not the way, especially in this culture, that it worked. The younger would serve the older. The older would be the one who would take on the responsibility of the family business. The older would be the one who would get a double portion of the inheritance. So when they divided the inheritance, it would, it's all divided by each son equally, except for the oldest son, it was plus one for him, so he got a double portion. But the greater stake here is not just the financial or the business side of things. or anything. The greater thing issue at stake here is who's going to carry the covenant blessing, the covenant promise that God, that, that God established with his grandfather Abraham, right? Who's going to carry, who's going to be the one who's going to, you know, that, that, that ultimately the Messiah is going to be born from, that's going to be the blessing to all nations. It should be Esau, but it's actually Jacob. Look what Matthew says. You don't have to flip there. It's going to be on the screen. It said, this is the genealogy in Matthew. We skip through these sometimes, but these are really important. This is the genealogy of Jesus. It says, who was the son of David? The son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob. Now, You'd think it would say Esau, but it's the father of Jacob because Jacob ultimately is the one who's going to get the blessing, and we're going to see that. Look, look, look with me at verse 24 in Genesis 25. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. <laughs> Isn't that a great description of a baby? You know, look at your new baby. He is so red and hairy. I mean, it's, it's great. Congratulations. God bless you. You know, I actually, I don't know if you knew this or not, but I was able to, I looked around a little bit online this week, and I was actually able to find a picture of Esau. I think I'm there for you. If you take it. There he is. <laughs> you know, Congratulations. Um, but, you know, this was the description of him. It, look at verse 26. Uh, Jacob's description really isn't that much better. It says, After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Now, Jacob in Hebrew meant, may God protect, but it sounds like a word for deceiver. And for someone who's, who's grasping at a heel, he would be considered a deceiver. And so Jacob gets pinned with this name his whole life as someone who is a deceiver. And that's actually who he becomes. He becomes quite the deceiver. And parents, it's a reminder to me on this Mother's Day that the words that we use with our kids can really determine the course of their life. I mean, in the midst of correcting and discipline, and please, you've got to do that. In the midst of correcting and discipline, don't lose sight of the importance of helping them see their potential in Jesus. Your words matter. If you tell them all the time that they're good for nothing, don't be surprised one day when you look up and they're good for nothing. Your words matter. Now look at verse 27. Look what it says. It says, The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man in the open country. While Jacob was content to stay home among the tents, Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, we could stop right there and talk about this for a moment. This is a major red flag. 
parents, right? I mean, if, you, if one parent loves one child more and one parent loves the other child more, this is not going to be a very content home. There's going to be a lot of this, this going to be a lot of dysfunction. In fact, if you want to feel a little bit better about your family and maybe some dysfunction you have, just go home and read about the patriarchs and their families. You'll feel much better by the end of the day, I can guarantee you. But it says, once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. This is why he is also called Edom. Edom just literally means red. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some little st lentil stew. He ate and drank, and then he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Now, you and I read that perhaps, and maybe we've got a little bit of sympathy for Esau. I mean, he kind of got took here, right? I mean, in fact, most of us would probably like Esau. He was, he was a type of person that, we, you know, we, that was, he loved to hunt, kind of a man's man. He, was, he loved his father. He would have probably been a, good, a pretty good neighbor. But do you notice what his biggest issue is here? See, the biggest issue with Esau is that he didn't think much about the promises of God. He really didn't think much about the promises of God. One commentary said Esau showed contempt for the blessing and promises of God, but what he despises, Jacob desires. And I think that this is really sort of the bottom line for each of us in here this morning, is that you either desire or despise God's promises. Right? I mean, we can, we can, we can sort of you know, work this any way we want, but I think this is the bottom line, is that we either desire God's promises or we despise God's promises. And you can say in here, and I can ask you, hey, raise your hand if you desire God's promises. And you say, yeah, or you say, amen, I want this. But our life sometimes preaches a different story. See, God's promises and blessings, do you know how they come? They come through faithful obedience. They come through trusting Him. See, it's silly for us to ask God's blessing financially. God, bless me and bless my And then not trust Him with our money. Right? I mean, it's silly for us to, to ask God to bless our marriages and then not love our wife as Christ loved the church. See, God's promises and blessing, they're always found in faithful obedience to his word. And, for, and you know, for many of us, we're like Esau, right? I mean, we despise the enduring blessing that God wants to give us, and sometimes we do it in exchange for something so temporary, right? Just something that's fleeting, for Esau, it cost him his birthright. It cost him the covenant blessing, the promises of God. And for us, sometimes that choice, the stakes are just as high. They're just as high. Notice how Hebrews relate to this. And you can go ahead there, and we're in Hebrews 12. The author says it like this. We'll be in verse 14. He says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy without holiness no one will see the Lord see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many see that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son afterward as you know he wanted to inherit this blessing he was rejected even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. You know, one of the great things I think about the Word of God is that we see imperfect people. It would be a little intimidating if we read God's Word and all we saw was these great examples of people being faithful and obedient time after time again because we know that's not our story. We know that we stumble. We know that we fall. But the point isn't for us to read about Esau and shake our head at him. The point is for us to learn. God gives us these examples for our benefit, for us to, to learn from their mistakes and not to actually repeat them. And we hear Esau's story, right, church? We hear his story, and we he see he sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. But we sometimes do the exact same thing. For us, it's the equivalent of a single bowl of soup that we're willing to take, and we miss out on the showers of blessings in God's life. 
Did you notice some of the examples that he gave here? Look at verse 14. He says, live in peace with everyone and to be holy. And so when it comes to peace in our lives, I wonder sometimes if we don't choose a bowl of soup over peace. I wonder if we don't choose a bowl of soup over what's God's blessing. When, when, think about what your natural reaction is. When you're, is your natural reaction when someone disagrees with you or you don't get your way or someone makes you mad? What's your natural reaction? Your natural reaction is to do the same thing you did when you were two years old, right? You, you either want to pout and cry or you want to throw a fit. That's what we do. I mean, we revert back. We're like two years old again because we didn't, we didn't get our way. And the easy thing to do, the Esau effect, is when we have a disagreement, is when we get mad or something's going on, is to fly off the handle and tell someone what we really think about them. I mean, that, that brings some temporary satisfaction, right? I told her the way it is. You know, I told him. And we think, you know, we, you know and that brings some temporary peace, or not peace, but some satisfaction maybe. Or maybe that's not your style, and so you're tired of, of the, the conflict, and so you just cut them off, and they're trying to resolve it, but you're not going to not gonna have any way. And in your mind, you're, you're thinking, or you're saying at least, well, I just don't want to argue anymore, but you actually find satisfaction in knowing that it bothers them, that you've cut off communication. And so instead of making the hard work of making peace, we choose the flesh over what's best. Instead of the, having the harmony that comes that when our relationships are right, we're content to sit back and just to eat our little bowl of soup. I'm just going to, I'll be right here. I'm just going to have this little bowl of soup. I, I remember when I was working, uh, uh, I did a little short time in between ministry. I was working actually in law enforcement. One of the saddest cases I've ever worked was between a father and a son who had become estranged. The father was a farmer. He had worked his whole life. He built a, a great farm in our, in our county. And, but he had recently fallen on some, some difficult times and as a result he needed some loans from the bank but he couldn't get any loans unless he transferred the farm over into the son's name and he did that well at some point the relationship got really bad between the father and the son and uh, as a result the son's name was now on the property and on the house and he told the dad I want you out I want you gone and he had a legal right he was kicking him off his own farm. He was kicking him off of his own property. Uh, even though he hadn't built for it or worked for it, he had the legal right. It got, it got ugly. Names were called. Guns were pulled. They allowed money, a bowl of soup, to destroy the peace in their relationship. They chose a flesh over what was best. You know what Jesus said when it comes to our relationships? You know what Jesus said when it comes to conflict in our life? He said, if you got something against your brother or a sister, you need to go take care of that first before you even come and offer your worship. Do you realize that? That you come and you settle those things. And listen, you can't determine how someone's going to respond. You can't, you, know, you can't make someone like you again, or you can't make the relationship better, but you, can, but you can step up and say, you know what, I'm sorry on my behalf. I want to make things right. You can offer forgiveness. You can offer your part. That's what Jesus tells us to do. And here's the reason why. Here's the danger. When we settle for conflict, we're setting ourselves up for what? A bitter heart. Look what it says in verse 15. He says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, so that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See, that's what happens to us. When we allow our relationships to be destroyed, if we're not really careful, bitterness creeps in. Bitterness comes in, and, when, and if that's not dealt with, if you don't deal with that bitterness in your heart, it'll grow and grow and grow to the point to where, as, as he says here in verse 15, what, how does he say? That it's going to defile you, that it'll defile many. It sours us from the inside, and not only does it hurt our relationship with that person, it hurts our relationship with God. That's what happened with Esau. Look, look at Genesis 27. on the Esau, it says, held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother. Now, hopefully you're not to that point. Hopefully you're not to the point to where you're ready to kill somebody if your relationship is soured. But that's what happens. Bitterness creeps in. It defiles you. It hurts your relationship with that person. And it hurts your relationship with 
God. The author gives us another example, though, how we're susceptible to this. I've just kind of been thinking about it this week as the Esau syndrome. And this Esau syndrome that we all have. Notice what else in verse 16. Look what it says. See to it that no one is sexually immoral. See to it that no one is sexually immoral. Now, I know our kids are in here. And, um, but they probably aren't listening to me at this point. Some of our adults aren't listening at this point. So, but listen, if your kids are, and they probably perk up if they hear that S word. But your kids, if they're big enough to hear me talk about this, then they're probably big enough for you to talk to this about them at home. Okay? Don't let a kid at school or a teacher at school do your job. This is your job. This is one of the joys of parenting, right? You get to talk to your kids about these things. Um, but, but teach them about God's way and what God desires. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. But it's easy in this area, especially as it pertains to uh, sexual morality, to settle for a bowl of soup. And we miss out on the incredible blessing of God as a result. I mean, think about this. I'm just going to run a gamut here. Think about same-sex relationships. Okay? We hear about this a lot more in our culture today. And in fact, in, in our world, it glorifies these, to, even though they're, they're contrary to the Word of God. And so the world says, well, hey, these are my feelings, and this is just, I'm not going to fight them. And the argument is, well, you know, this is, this is how I was born, or this is how I feel. But, but imagine with me for just a moment. Now, let's say that I have a natural tendency toward anger. And I've always had a natural indice, uh, 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 a tendency toward anger since I was a child. None of you would say, well, listen, that's just your... That's just kind of the way you're, you're that's, just, that's just you. You just fly off the handle anytime you feel like it, right? You just blow up. If you need to blow up, you just blow up and you let people, none of us will see, you wouldn't say that to me. And just, you'd say, no, you can't do that. You need to get that under control. Uh, the same, same thing is true here, right? I mean, couples want to find satisfaction in, in, in this desire of the flesh. And so they give in to the urge. And when they do that, they miss out. They miss the mark. They miss the ultimate blessing that God would have as a result. They get the flesh, but they're missing what's best. Same thing happens in heterosexual relationships, too. And we think, well, yeah, but I love him. I love her. We're so close. We're going to get married anyway. We're gonna... And so they just give in, and they just, they just, they just do it. And, and again, they just, it's just running contrary to the Word of God. They're missing the best. They're missing God's design. They're missing this incredible intimacy that can be found only in a marriage relationship. It happens when couples cohabitate. and say, well, it's just easier to move in. It's just more cost effective. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll do this later or some other time. But think about the witness. This leaves the generations behind you can possibly affect. Think about dating. Instead of waiting, single ladies and men, on a, for a godly choice for a spouse, what do we do? We panic. Oh no, all the good ones are taken. I've just got to, you know, I just got to, you know, first one, you know, whatever it may be. And so we jump into the wrong relationship and we sometimes miss this incredible blessing that God would have for us. Or pornography, some of you are going online and you're viewing this poison. You have no idea the damage that it's doing and it's causing you. You're settling for a bowl of soup. You're settling for a bowl of soup when God has so much more for you. And there's so many areas that we could talk about that we just settle. And, and, and we're missing this incredible promise that God would have. And here's the danger. Here's the incredible danger. Look at verse 17. The incredible danger says this. It's talking about Esau afterward. He wanted the inherit the blessing. He was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. He wanted the blessing, but it was too late. It was too late. Jacob would ultimately receive it, and it would change his life forever. He couldn't change, and he missed out on the incredible opportunity to be blessed by God. It's a sad story that we are doomed to repeat if we do not learn from the Word of God. And so let me give you one simple application point as we wrap this thing up today. It's just simply this. When you're making decisions, as you, you, know, as you have this grid for your decision making in your life, ask this simple question. It's going to be up on the screen. Am I settling for a bowl of soup? Am I settling for a bowl of soup? And so as you make the ever decisions every day about money, about time, about your relationships, about all your choices, are you just settling for a bowl of soup? 
Because if you are, you're missing out on so much more. You're missing out on the promises and the blessings of God. Are you settling for a bowl of soup? You know, the one person I think about that, that didn't just settle for a bowl of soup was actually Esau's nephew. You know who I'm talking about? Esau's nephew, a guy named Joseph. Joseph, I think at a very young age, decided that, that it was going to be more important for him to trust God regardless of anything, any circumstances in my life. Joseph, if you remember his story, Joseph would be sold off into slavery by his brothers at a young age. And yet he was still faithful to God's promise. He would land in a home of a guy named Potiphar. Potiphar, whose wife wanted to sleep with Joseph. You know what Joseph did? He could say, no, no, that's just a bowl of soup. I'm not going there. I'm not going to sleep with you. And he ran, and he got out of there as fast as he could. His reward was being thrown into prison. Joseph's thrown into prison. God hadn't forgot about him. It seemed like he had. For years and years he sat there. And he sat there. For two years he waited for God. He waited for the, waited for the blessing. He thought, he had to thank God. I'm doing everything right. Why haven't I been released yet? But then when the time was just right, God made a way. He made a way for Joseph to be released from prison. And as a result, the children of Israel were saved. He blessed him. And he blessed his descendants in an incredible, incredible way. Listen, you and I, we can't undo the past. We can't undo what's already been done. I mean, there, there, there's nothing. I mean, and, and, and all, every single one of us, we've chosen a bowl of soup, haven't we? I mean, every single one of us, we've, we've, we've blown it here. We can't undo the past, but we can change the future. We can be, we, in, moving ahead, we can trust God. And we can trust God's word. And we can trust his promises. And we can trust his blessing. And we can be assured that God alone, that God alone is worthy of following. And, and, and James tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from God above. He wants to shower us with the blessings. Will you desire them? Or will you despise them? So bottom line today. You, do you desire God's blessing? I know I do. I know I do. And listen, one of the main reasons why I, I chose to, to go into the ministry when I, when I did, you know, at, at a young age was because, because I wanted people to understand God's incredible blessing in their life. When you're obedient to God, when you trust God, when you're walking with Him, God regenerates your heart. He changes your life. And all those things that used to keep you locked up and, and down and, and in shackles with sin and, and all the mess that goes with it, that you can be set free. You can truly truly jesus said i've come that you may have life and to have it abundantly and that's what i've discovered as we're faithfully and obedient and we desire the blessings of god just now this morning i want to do things just a little bit different i'm i'm just going to ask you we're going to have uh, and our ladies are going to come forward at this time and and i've just asked them to play uh, kind of just in the background and you know, i just want you to bow your head just for a time of prayer and not only do I want you to, to spend some time reflecting and asking yourself that question, have I settled for a bowl of soup? Or, or asking your, that, yourself that question, do I desire or despise God's promises? Spend some time thinking about that. In fact, some of you this morning, as you sit there and pray in prayer, you may want to come forward. You know, I'll be happy to pray with you. One of our elders will be happy to pray with you. But we don't have to. You, you're welcome to come forward. You can come forward and sit on the front row. You can come take a knee and just and, and have a knee at the steps and have prayer. We're, there's going to be plenty of time if you want to do that. And so I'm going to ask Jeff if he'll just pull the lights down just a little bit. And, and we're just going to spend just a little bit of time in reflection and prayer. So let's do that at this time.